Hello and welcome to the Monster Mechanics Podcast, where we take creatures of myth and media and see how they can be improved. I am your host, Scott Paladin, and with me as always is the He-Man to my cringer, Zach Jaquays. What are we talking about today, Zach? Today we are talking about one of the absolute classic monsters of D&D, the Beholder. If there's anybody in the world who doesn't know what a, a Beholder is, now is the time they have to learn. Okay, so a Beholder is a floating spherical creature with just way too many eyes. It's got a big old central eye, and then it has 10 eye stalks ringing the top of its head. Okay. To make matters worse, all these eyes shoot laser beams of some sort. Not just laser beams, but they do things like petrifying or disintegrating or putting you to sleep. And the central eye emits an area where no magic can occur in front of it. Oh, okay. And so if it wasn't clear, how do they get around? They appear to just sort of levitate. Oh, okay. So they just float. Just a big floating head. Big old floating eyeball. With an eyeball. And a mouth. And a big old mouth. And in case anybody hasn't realized, this is a play on the eye of the beholder. That This is obviously a monster that started with that pun, and they just Mm -hmm. went from there. (laughs) I have to say, the first edition art for these guys is is pretty bad i oh, mean yeah. most of the first edition art is pretty bad but like they did a little bit better with things that had some sort of basis but the newer versions of beholders look much cooler than the oh, original yeah. beholder looked yeah he looked uh he looked pretty manky i mean back then you got whoever you could to illustrate these things yeah you didn't yeah. always get the best artists no that's fine i honestly Art that is a little bit off and also a little bit spare is, I think, a little bit better because people use their imagination more. Mm -hmm. To me, uh, that's that's entirely a personal preference. Um, Okay, so we have to make these guys not... I don't know. We're going to try to make them our own. Sure. They're not... This isn't the Umplebee. Like, we don't have to start from scratch and make them cool. They're super well-beloved. I don't know if there's a creature more iconic for for D&D as a game than the Beholder. Oh, yeah. I mean, I know uh, Wizards of the Coast has it trademarked. Like, you're not going to see Beholders in any other works of art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess on that note, like, our usual thing about all the ideas in our podcast are released under a do what the fuck you want public license. Mm -hmm. We don't get to give away beholders that way. So anything we create about beholders you can use, but obviously they're still copywritten by Wizards of the Coast. Mm -hmm. So I I think if I remember correctly, pretty much everything about beholders is answered with magical bullshit, right? Yeah, pretty much uh, they float because magic and they do everything else because magic. Because magic. And I mean, like that's got to be even their explanation for how they reproduce and stuff, right? Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, and I mean, they, these are intelligent creatures, right? They are. Uh, they're, in fact, they're. I think they're remembered as like one of the most intelligent creature, like monsters you're going to come across. Yeah, right? they're they're usually described as very very intelligent, very egotistical, mm-hmm. paranoid to a fault. Yeah. Okay. So, I think that we need to take them in the direction of trying to remove magic from as many questions as possible for these guys okay like an, like if it answers everything with magic let's try to answer some of the stuff like we're not gonna be able to get rid of all of it because i think a, a non-magical beholder is not a beholder at all mm-hmm. so we're just gonna have to pare it back as much as possible okay so i think by that token the place to start is that locomotion thing mm-hmm. i don't think we need to give them legs because a, a, a legged beholder is pretty goofy looking honestly <laughs> I don't know. You could kind of go with like a, a spider kind of effect and just really ramp up that horror. You, but you, let's stick let's with the floating. For I think now. floating is kind of part of their thing. Flo- floating eyeball is kind of like your your elevator pitch for a beholder. Anyways. Yeah. The answer to that has got to be lighter than air gas sacks, right? Okay. Um, I can't think of another floating physical thing. Like you can either, unless you give them hummingbird wings, um, which we get into scale problems for. Oh, so yeah. I, I think they've got to have like a couple of air sacs inside of them that are full of hot air. Okay. Um, and then, okay, how do they get, not hot air. It's got to be like. Like helium or hydrogen. Helium or? or hydrogen or something like this. Or or made up, but still like yeah. physical. Elf gas. gas. Yeah, elf gas or something like that. Um, if you're going to pull from Spelljammer, then you could use something like Phlogiston. Mm-hmm. which is there, um, that's what is between all of the spheres. Where we're going with that because I love that. Yeah, Phlogiston's cool. Oh, okay, so this is a, this because how would they get it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so either they're from that, like they're from the Phlogiston, like they're from the the space between the spheres. Okay, so. That's uh, kind of a cool idea. Um, there's always been like that kind of that idea of the far realms where like mm-hmm. all these aberration type creatures come from. And the okay. Holders are a type of aberration. Yeah. So maybe that's a core component of the far realm. Okay. 
how, okay, so how do they get the phlogiston inside them? Do they have to like go and get it or does it like they just have the same amount that they've always had? Cause they're not going to be in a, if they're, if they're in a prime material plane, they're not going to be around that a lot. Well, does their, their innate biology generate it maybe? Could be. What if they have a tiny portal inside them? That, okay. That creates well, the Now flow. we're going back to the, the magical bullshit. Okay. Yeah, that is true. Um, but go, go ahead. Have well, it. I was thinking, because you could, you could then extend that to all of their eye stalks, mm-hmm. where each of the eye stalks, like the eyes of the, of the beholder, are actually, like in their pupils, are little portals to various okay. different planes. And mm-hmm. so when they open those up, they let out whatever. It's just, it's not like, it, okay, as a, as a tangent, this is supposedly how Cyclops' mutant powers work, is that he has in his eyes... I'm going to say it the stupid way first, but he's got little portals to the punch dimension inside them. <laughs> there is apparently in Marvel a elemental plane of force. Okay. And so when he opens his eyes, just like force comes out. It's not like lasers or something. But that would be kind of a cool version of the Beholder where when they open their eyes, they're literally just opening a tiny portal all the way back to the elemental plane of fire. And like fire comes shooting out. Okay. Um, but if you're right, you're absolutely right about that being magical bullshit. <laughs> and so let's 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 back off that a bit. Okay, so they if they're going to make phlogiston themselves, maybe their biology doesn't make it, mm-hmm. but they are they're intelligent creatures and so something about them they figured out how to manufacture it. Okay. Disintegration ray is one of their big powers, right? Yeah. So maybe it's something about like if they combine disintegration ray with another one of their beams, mm-hmm. then what they produce is is like they create a cloud of phlogiston. Mm-hmm. And they can quickly in, like consume that, or maybe they're just maybe they're really good chemists or something, or like mm. alchemists, where by deep within the earth they can find uh, the right combination of mem- of chemicals and heat and time, and they have to make it like in a jar, and then they swallow that and put it into their air sacs. Well, I really like the idea of going back to those those I beams being conjoined, like. Mm-hmm creating different effects than mm-hmm. their intended effect. I feel like it reminds me of um, an old computer RPG that came out a long time ago called uh, Magica. Okay. Where you played a wizard who had mastery over these eight elements. Yeah. And you combined up to five of these elements in different ways. And depending on the order that you combine them, you got different effects. And it was a very interesting gameplay mechanic. I like that a lot, actually. The The idea of having... They have 10 eye stocks, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so having the idea of having some percentage of those you have five tools between them maybe they're doubling up or something mm-hmm. and that all of the variety of what they can do with them is really just a con- like swapping them over and combining the two of them you know if you put stock number one and two together you get this particular kind of effect mm-hmm. and some of those are super useful and some of those aren't maybe some of them are like niche useful that gives them more like a toolkit rather mm-hmm. than just like a single use item that it happens to be attached to them like a, oh, a yeah. an idea of Another interesting thing is uh, the anti-magic cone that they emit from their their central eye. Yeah, uh, also affects their own eye beams. Okay, so yeah, and which implies that their eye beams affect one another. Mm-hmm. That anti-magic cone sounds, sounds like such bullshit too. Like that's oh, got to yeah. be the killer for all the all the parties, right? Yeah, it's um, it's obnoxious. <laughs> so, what? Why would they have an anti-magic? Like, that is their main weapon, if it's their main eye, right? Mm -hmm. Why is that put at such high importance for them? Like, what is it about the beholder that that they prioritize almost above almost everything else, undoing magic? Maybe it's something about the Far Realms. Like, the other creatures that live there almost all have magical abilities. And Mm -hmm. so, like, it is super important that you have the ability to defend yourself against them. Mm -hmm. Or maybe even something about the nature of that area where... Like, if you cannot negate, I don't know, like, oh, wait. So if, if we're talking about the, like, they're from a place with the phlogiston is mm-hmm. everywhere, right? Um, maybe, if I remember correctly from Spelljammer, phlogiston's basically always uh, on fire. It's always kind of burning. Okay. Un- and how, here's an idea. Unless it's in the effects of an anti-magic field. Interesting. So, like, this is their way to sort of travel through these these burning... Um, incandescent clouds of gas is mm-hmm. by like casting in front of them the anti-magic field which puts out this dangerous fire 
that allows them to travel through it. So that this makes it like an an inert, uh, an inert gas that they can actually consume. Exactly. So it's to fuel their buoyancy. And be, yeah, and they've they've learned to harness the phlogiston in a way that no one else has. Okay, I like that. That's actually really cool. That makes that that one thing which sounds like something something a GM came up with to challenge his players into an integral part of the beholder. Yeah. Okay. I like. That. And okay, they definitely have to be from a realm where there is no down. Right, mm-hmm. like they are a. Are they radius radially symmetrical? Not uh, almost, because they've got the mouth, right? Yeah. What if they? What if they were radially symmetrical and the mouth is on the back? Interesting. Like, I don't know. Something about that just sounds cool to me. Like the bit of kind of like, what benefit does that serve it? Um, I don't know. I like it though. Uh, oh, right. Uh, really, really. Okay, so why does it have a mouth? Because it, it uses it to consume the phlogiston. Uh, so I guess it's got to have... It also, it also communicates, which... Okay, it speaks. So yeah, maybe it has to have the mouth in the front so that it can consume the phlogiston that it that it is making inert mm-hmm. so that it can ingest it. Although I can't remember if beholders communicate te- uh, telepathically or not. Well... Mm-hmm. That seems to be a big big thing they do with a lot of those monstrous underdark races yeah let's 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 ignore that for now if we, sure if we, maybe that's an advanced beholder thing like a like a late stage beholder we're still and talking that's, about that's introducing can, more uh more magical more, yeah. more magical mumbo jumbo yeah, yeah if they've got a mouth then they can talk sure so um which means they've also probably got like some lungs or something well they've got their air sacs right sure um which okay i kind of like the idea have you ever seen um if you if you look inside of an owl's ear I have not. Yeah, um, I'll I'll put a link in the show notes. If you if you pull open, like separate the feathers, and you look down the canal for an owl's ear, you can see the back of its own eyeball. Interesting, because the eyes in an owl are so large that they have to intrude upon that cavity. That's pretty much how beholders look when they open their mouth. Like you open your mouth, and you can see it opens its mouth, and in the roof you can see it's probably covered with some bone and ridges and stuff. But like there is the bulge of its eye, mm-hmm. and like. I kind of like the idea it opens its mouth and you can see organs and things. Like it's not necessarily connected directly to some sort of digestive system Mm because it may or may not need that. It just has to get gas and things inside of it. Mm -hmm. And it's managed, It's they've added teeth so that it has like a weapon. But like the mouth isn't really about like eating directly into a stomach. You can like, it opens its mouth and you see the air sacs moving and you see its circulatory system. And like, so, and there's just all just covered by like a thin membrane because really all it needs is to not chew on its own organs. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So this, oh, that's gross. Okay, so what are these other? Do you do you remember the other eye stalks, or are we going to make them up? Or so let's see. Let me see if I can list them all off from memory. Yeah, we've got the death ray, which is just a ray that kills people. Ugh. Yeah, okay. We've got the disintegration ray. Okay, we're done. Petri- the petrification ray. Okay, a ray that slows things. Okay, charms them, mm. puts them to sleep, paralyzes them. Uh, and I've got three more that I can't remember off the top okay. of my head. So it seems like these have a lot of overlap, like sleep and paralysis. And yeah. and like, and honestly, like charm is just, eh, I don't like charm as a, as a thing. I feel like it has some interesting, uh, like if that's, it's like, it's such a nasty monstrous creature. Like mechanically speaking, there's a lot of question marks there, but yeah. like. From a ecological standpoint, like if that's how it gets things to do its bidding, is just it it charms whatever creature it needs to do things for it. Yeah, I, the direction I was thinking about going was maybe a lot of the things that it does. That when we see those eye beams mm-hmm. and the effects they have, those aren't it, their actual effects. Not when I say the actual effects; those aren't the original intended uses of those of okay. those things. Instead, those are what happens when it uses them on things other than the phlogiston. And things from the far realms. So we kind of got like a, a Superman yellow sun effect. Exactly. Where like the like the disintegration ray, maybe that one's that one's close enough. Like that's a that's a thing that destroys things in front of it. Like they mm-hmm. use that for carving out asteroids and, and things like that to make make their homes. Sure. But the the like turning things to stone is about what that's actually meant is to solidify the phlogiston into walls and things that they can build with. Okay. And that it creates maybe not stone, but something a lot like stone or, or a um, another like a like a metal or something like that, or even like a wood substance or plastic mm-hmm. is what it creates out of the phlogiston, and that's what they build their nests out of. But that when it gets to when it gets to a pl- prime material plane and there isn't any phlogiston except what's inside of it or what it makes, it tried using that that uh, uh, condenser beam, and instead it turns flesh to stone. Okay, yeah. um, and where. 
each of those ideas, maybe they had a, a more naturalistic intended purpose originally, mm-hmm. where they this was something that was sort of innate to the beholder's existence in the when it was off in the far realms, living amongst Phlogiston all the time. And this is just it repurposing them. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I kind of like the idea, just so that you don't have, you have less to keep track of, it's maybe got 10 eye stocks mm-hmm. and a couple of the beams just don't do anything. You, like they, they kind of just don't do anything okay. because yeah. like it has a purpose in the, in where it's from. Mm-hmm. And, but here, like there's no phlogiston and it doesn't happen to do anything useful. So it's just kind of a, a spare. Okay. Yeah. I like that. I have an idea, which is the only reason to put it in here is to make beholders a little bit weirder and a little bit weaker, Okay, which is that each eye only has a certain number of uses before it burns out. Hmm. At which point it spits the eye out. And another one comes up the eye stalk and then slots into this place. But that takes a certain amount of time. <laughs> like a snake swallowing an egg in, in reverse. reverse. Yes. It's awful. Uh, or, um, or if you ever see a turtle laying eggs like that. I haven't and now I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, don't. Don't look it up. Unless you are whatever the gross out version of a masochist is. I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, of course you will. <laughs> Uh, but I like that because then it gives a, A, it's gross and it's weird. And making beholders of all creatures should be just so gross and mm-hmm. so weird. And make giving it something that will that will throw people off is great. But then it also means that like, this is why it doesn't just spam disintegrate over and over again. Okay. Yeah. Because it can do that five times, let's say. Mm-hmm. And then, then it has to spit that eye out and it's lost a little bit of vision and it can't use that spell again really quickly. Okay, that's an interesting mechanic, yeah. Right, and that that gives them a reason to use something other than their most powerful spell all the time. Yeah, I know uh, right now the, the common thing is just it's completely random when you're playing in Dungeons & Dragons. So right. You, you never know what you're going to get. Yeah, and I think that making it smart but giving it a limitation that forces it to use the other things, I mm-hmm. think is, I think that, that works out a little bit better. Otherwise, you've just sort of given them a randomness that isn't that isn't sensical, you know. Yeah. You were talking about before we started about something about uh, beholder um, intelligences and their sanity. Oh yes. So one of the interesting things about beholders is most of them have it's called a, a split mind, where they have basically two personalities or intelligences sharing the space in a single beholder. Okay. And usually those two minds hate each other. <laughs> The other thing is that um, there's occasionally you'll have a beholder with just a single mind, and those are considered the, the beholders that are insane okay. because they don't have those two competing minds. Interesting. This reminds me of a, um, I think it was from a Charles Strauss book. There were, it's an entity which is two AIs in a single body. Okay. And they were put there specifically to keep both of them sane, mm-hmm. where this is a world where uh, if an AI is left to its own, and where a mind is left on its own, um, it'll go crazy over time. It'll okay. go rampant. And if you put two of them together in the same body, at least they have, always have someone to talk to. Mm-hmm. And and that means that they can stay sane longer, okay. uh, which is just an interesting kind of parallel. I kind of like the idea that, oh, wh- how would you end up with, biologically, how would you end up with two intelligences in a single body? There is the concept in actual like human brains. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a theory running around that the two hemispheres of your of your mind actually have like are a lot more separate than we think they are. Mm-hmm. The if for anybody who's a little bit rusty on their brain anatomy, um, brains have two halves hemispheres, and they're connected by a single um, trunk of lots and lots of neurons called the corpus callosum. And occasionally, they used to actually use this as a treatment for epilepsy. They'd just snip that, just cut it right in half. Mm-hmm. So there are people out there who have two two halves of their brains not connected to one another. Mm-hmm. And you can do interesting experiments with them where if you like block off the vision from one eye, where each eye sees something or sees two different uh, images, Mm -hmm. if you ask them questions, they will only, they will respond with only the things they see with one, with one eye because each eye feeds into one half of the brain. Mm -hmm. But the other eye, if it sees something, that hand, the corresponding hand will also like react in the same way. Like they are, and I cannot, I will, I'll admit, I cannot remember which one's right and which one's left. Mm -hmm. So if you show them, if they're on a table and there's a, um, one side can only, can see a, a pen, for example. Okay. And they, other side can't. You ask them, please pick up the pen. They'll say, there's no pen in front of me. And then that hand will reach out and pick up the pen. 
Interesting. Implying that there actually is a second sort of mind within our own mind that has no voice. Like it doesn't have the ego, the sense of like who I am and what I do. And it cannot speak at all, Mm -hmm. but it can still react and choose things. Like they've even done things. Its opinion can even differ from the conscious mind where they've asked them like pick out your favorite color. And the, the, they'll say, okay, this is green. And then the other hand will point to a different color. Oh, wow. Implying that they actually are, like, they'll have differing opinions. It's right. so wild. Yeah. And uh, one, of the, one of the outstanding questions is, how connected are they normally? Like, if you, if you do not have a, a, a severed corpus callosum, or, or do you, would you have some of the same sort of behavior or not? Mm-hmm. Uh, I do not know off the top of my head, but it's a big outstanding question, which I love. And that was just a big tangent about something cool. <laughs> no, yeah, I like that. Well, going back to like sort of the, how that manifests or, mm-hmm. or reasons behind it, sort of an idea I had was uh, maybe that ties into like it's sort of reproduction, like it sort of grows this second mind internally over time. And when it's ready to reproduce, like, it ejects that mind somehow into a, a new beholder. As if they, um, I just can't stand you anymore. Get the hell out of here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, that actually I like. Yeah, that I heard this off the internet, which is the, uh, the idea that when it's ready to reproduce, it does that same sort of ejection maneuver with its main central eye. Oh. And that becomes an egg or maybe another smaller beholder. Okay. Yeah. Which is super gross and I love oh, it. Yeah. So let's just go with that. Okay. So if it's got the two minds, one that's sort of attached to the eye. Mm-hmm. And one that is attached mainly to the body. Mm-hmm. Ooh, actually, maybe they're slightly different. They're not. This isn't. The, this isn't the meeting of equals. Mm-hmm. Each eye, the little ones and the big ones, have a brain sort of attached to it. Okay. So you've got a big brain that's on the main eye, mm-hmm. and all of the other little eyes have brains attached to them as well. And maybe even some of the ones that are still inside, ready to be pushed out the tubes to mm-hmm. replace the one that's out. So you have a collective intelligence made up of a bunch of little brains. Okay, I like that. That thinks of itself as sort of a we. Mm -hmm. And then you have the one big ego intelligence connected to the main eye. Mm -hmm. And they're in communication with one another. That's kind of cool. That implies that at some point in the past, the the beholder was a, like a a colony creature. Mm -hmm. That maybe they fused together. So if every one of those eyes has uh, a brain attached, um, are you thinking like these eyes would also have kind of like an, an ego and whatnot? Because if not, like if they have like a limited lifespan or whatever, yeah, um, basically like, like five or ten shots yeah. of their their yeah. their central beam, like is there sort of like a like these eyes are precious with it, so this beholder never really seems to do anything or can't I convince. Think, I think it's more like like the um, like the big eye, which maybe doesn't have the same limitations that the smaller ones do mm-hmm. about how many times it can be shot, or maybe it's more about like if it has time between, like you can recover, then it can extend itself really long. So mm-hmm. that one is that one is very eye-centered. It is an ego. Mm-hmm. And then the rest of them are all sort of low-level intelligence individually, but okay. that when they're in contact with one another, then they are equal to the other big brain. Okay. But they act as a sort of collective intelligence, and they, they act in concert to counteract that one big one. Okay, and so and like once the uh, the main eyeball kind of sheds its yeah. eyeball to create an egg, like the remaining eye stalks or whatever yeah. kind of form the, the intelligence that guides this thing until its main eye regenerates. Exactly, they get to take they get a, a an amount of like precious respite from mm-hmm. each other where they're like, okay, we are done for a while. But okay. then one of those little ones, one of the ones that was in a sack waiting to be shoved out and become one of the eye stalk ones, mm-hmm. instead gets put into its place and it starts to become bigger and bigger and bigger over okay. time. Yeah, and I then like it that. becomes the ego one. And then the, all, the, all the other ones, like it stops being part of the we and starts being, being the I. Okay, yeah. Um, in both, I'm sorry, the I, just the single letter I, the ego yeah. style. Because <laughs> um, they're all eyes. <laughs> and so until the collective intelligence gets fed up of that one too and injects it and it becomes an egg. And then um, like you can, I'm, I'm trying to imagine how this one big floating eyeball turns into a beholder. So you can kind of imagine it like calcifying over and like, or maybe forming a cocoon until like the organs grow or I don't know. Like maybe it loses, um, like the eye kind of falls out or whatever. Yeah. And then maybe one of its, or some of its eye stalks work together to create sort of like that skin cocoon around it. Oh, so actually the, the big eye is at the, uh, at the mercy of all the other ones. Yeah. Because they could decide, mm, screw you, and just let it dry up mm-hmm. and, and die. Mm-hmm. 
uh, or they can use their various eye stock abilities to yeah to build a, a cocoon out of the phlogiston, which then develops into a another beholder who is originally built around that one big eye. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that one that one big brain like kind of starts to split out and stuff, and so you end up that that that's where the first part of the new collective comes from, as that one eye turns into. So an interesting thing to note is um, if we follow like the the chain of um, chain of eyeballs, yeah, like, like <laughs> the, the chain the chain of reproduction for this yeah. beholder, like every new quote unquote beholder is formed from the same eye, yeah, in, well, in, in its in in its ancestry. There, no, no, some subset of them are because after it ejects that big eye, it mm-hmm. does make one of its small eyes grow big, and it could then eject that one. Mm-hmm. So there are. Okay, but like, like the eye never actually hatches. It's just, it's something that's built around. Right, right. So, okay, I, I like this idea. There's there's two kinds of big eye. Okay. There's first eyes or original eyes mm-hmm. or something like that, and then there are the like second level reproduced eyes. Mm-hmm. So at some point, let's we're gonna say that there were the first beholders, right? There's maybe mm-hmm. not just one. There's like a, let's say a thousand of them. All right. Mm-hmm. And in one generation, they all expel their eyes. And then those become the sec- the next 2,000 beholders. Okay. All right? Well, the, that first generation, the original ones who expelled their eyes, they get new ones. Mm-hmm. They replace them. They can then expel those, and they make the second, another set, another 1,000. Mm-hmm. But those second 1,000s, because they didn't have the original eyes, mm-hmm. are treated as kind of like second-class citizens. Okay. Like there's something kind of off with them. And so you will occasionally— what? Something off with a beholder? Well, no. <laughs> the other beholders will definitely think it's off. And so what you'll find is that like there's there's like a thousand beholders out there who still have the original eyes, like that first generation, that whenever they get expelled, that new beholder is made out of them. Mm-hmm. And so they're, there's like a maybe a cultural pressure that those are like all, you're never allowed to let those die off mm-hmm. because they're super important and they've been growing this whole time. And so they're like, that's like the elders of the beholder society are mm-hmm. these like original eyeballs that keep getting transferred from beholder to beholder. Uh-huh. Whereas there's a whole bunch of other ones which are made from second, third, fourth, like they're, they're much later generations because they're from after somebody expels that first eyeball, they grow another one. Mm-hmm. And then that one isn't really anything special because it was just a little eyeball made big. So is there like, like among these second generation beholders, is there any impetus to seek out and collect these eyes or like replace their own eyes with these ur eyes yes that's so gross that yes it has to, i mean it absolutely has to be the case because that's so weird yeah that if a like maybe it was one of those things it's a um an adaptation that allows you to sort of if you have just expelled your big eye mm-hmm. and for whatever reasons you don't want to devote the resources to growing another big eye, you mm-hmm. can then grab that big eye and put it back in. Like it's, maybe it's, maybe a, it's like a, a human egg situation a, where a beholder like structure only has so many of these eyeball eggs. Oh, so if it gets old enough, like it's born with all of the eye, or born, I guess, if it's if it, when it first grown, it has all of the eyeball eggs that it's ever going to have. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, totally. So at some point it's like, okay, I'm done. I'm still going to have to, like, if, the, if I if I spit any more of these out, if I use my beams anymore, I'm going to run out completely. Mm-hmm. And so it has to kill another beholder and take all of the uh, the eyeballs out of its sacks. Oh. Ugh. I like that. That's great. Yeah, it has to rip it open. And we I mean, basically we've described them as they don't have a skull or anything. They're just a big sack of organs can, uh, wrapped in a, in a gross skin shell. Mm-hmm. And so it just has to rip that open. And it doesn't even need to, like, like it surgically implant them. It just eats them. It just shoves them in its mouth and then through that little membrane that we were talking about and they get absorbed back into the system. I like that. awful. I hate it. (laughs) I think that says something about beholder biology too, which is that they, the difference between something that's inside of them and outside of them is just a matter of their opinion, Mm -hmm. which is like, if they want to make something part of their body, they can just shove it in their mouth, open up that little membrane and like make it an organ. Interesting. And it won't work most of the time. Like if they if they took a like if they took a human spleen out, mm-hmm. like they don't have a use for a human spleen, but they definitely have use for human eyeballs. Uh because I think they could use those as beholder eyeballs if they need to. Uh, oh. so like similarly, like maybe like brains and things like that, or like whatever organ makes a displacer beast uh able to teleport around. They could like oh, interesting. They they have a little bit of innate 
uh, a limited amount of innate like biomechanical cybernetic ability like they can take other things like useful bits and ingest them into themselves if they need to that's awful i um, love it <laughs> that's so good it's probably like a, a beholder like organ market basically Oh, for sure. Yes. Probably a literal organ market somewhere, at least, where like their people are hawking their organs to one another. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. And maybe even, okay, so when they expel the big eyeball and they form another beholder around it, mm -hmm. that's probably some sort of process. Somewhere in there, they create a bunch of new little eyeballs too. Mm -hmm. And so a, a beholder farmer, basically one beholder who just like needs to manufacture lots of little eyeballs. Uh, might do that over and over again, making more and more other, like what would normally be new beholders. Mm -hmm. But then the moment that they're about to like hatch, you instead rip them open and take all of the little eyeballs out and ingest them uh -huh. or sell them off to other beholders. So there's a market there to allow those to like, to extend their life, their lives during that time where they'll continue to still have, Interesting. but it requires them to be part of beholder society and to be able to get a hold of other ones. Or if, or do it themselves over and over again as a really in a really gross form of life extension, uh, which seems highly appropriate to me. Oh yeah, these are so gross. I mean, like they didn't start as like particularly great to begin with, but oh mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay, so do they need to eat just like regular stuff? Um, I'm not entirely certain. Now well, let's let's decide. We remember that illithids that we decided feasted on memories, mm -hmm. right? Beholders don't need to eat brains. I don't think. I don't think that makes as much sense. No, I think um, maybe they're like we, we talked about them like consuming eyes and whatnot, mm -hmm. which is a, a thing they need to do, but isn't necessarily like food exactly mm -hmm. the same way. Like, well, an eye like takes in light, right? Like that it processes yeah. light. So maybe there's some kind of photosynthesis going on there, oh. but only through its eyes, which maybe doesn't track with them being subterranean creatures. I think, well, but it does track with our idea of them living in the phlogiston, which is constantly a flame. Mm -hmm. where light would be abundant all the time. Yeah. So it'd be very easy for them to get sustenance in that world. Mm -hmm. And maybe, I don't know exactly what it is about them being subterranean that like, maybe it's something about when they come to a primaterial plane, they feel compelled to be surrounded by rocks and things. And so they have to manufacture their own light, maybe by, maybe through chemical processes or they find uh, like veins of natural gas that they set aflame. Interesting. Or maybe they... Um, it's like through chemistry or they find magma or something like that. They're, they're, they're kind of huddled around, mm -hmm. um, which explains maybe why they're not everywhere. Okay. So them being part of the underdark they're that's where they're, they're usually seen or, in D and D, right? Maybe they don't need all that much light. And so the reason they aren't on the surface world, like in direct sunlight is because that would just be like too much. Oh, yeah. Too much overkill. Could be, or maybe it's something to do with, Oh no. I think we have an easier idea. They would have no problem living on the surface. They would love to because it would have a lot of light for them. Mm -hmm. What they can't stand is wind. Wind. Because oh, they're yeah. lighter than air. And they <sighs> can't really overcome strong air currents. Interesting. Okay, and, I like that. And so even a, like a light breeze totally f***s them up. Like you get a beholder up to the surface and it like gets carried off like a balloon. I like the idea that they, if they get high enough in the atmosphere, the, the pressure it difference. Pop. Yep. Pop. And all those little eyeballs come fall to earth. Oh. In a little splattery rain. Yep. I love it. Yep. Okay, okay. That's great. <laughs> yeah. So they would love to live on the surface if they could, but mm -hmm. they can't. So instead they're having to make do. And I, I, I actually love the idea that their tunnels are full of light all the time. They've come up with ways to do it because the, the everybody always kind of hates from practical reasons going into the underdark and then like not being able to see ever for like mm -hmm. all of your humans who don't have dark vision. Um, oh, yeah. well, so you didn't pack torches. Sucks to be you. So if beholders are going through a lot of trouble to make sure their layers are full of light, mm -hmm. then that's kind of a neat distinction. It gives you some variability to your underdark adventures. Mm -hmm. um, I like that a lot. In fact, maybe one of their beams makes like a like a fiber optic kind of material that carries light through it. Interesting. We were talking about them sort of building their nests. Or, or some other process they make. We, they, we, we talked about them like being able to make vloggers in their chemistry. So maybe it's something like that. Mm -hmm. But they find a way to make this material. They look like veins of crystal or something like that. And they put a strong light source on one spot in it, and it carries it through the rest of the crystal so that they can light all of their tunnels with it. That would look really cool. So that like, would look really cool. I want to do you one grosser. Yes, absolutely. So what if one of their eye stalks, like they have like things like petrification and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Like, what if that petrification beam, in conjunction with one of its other beams, 
makes organic material bioluminescent. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's gross. I like that. So, like, by the, the most awful way possible, like, it fills it with bioluminescent fluid or something. Or... Yeah. It, yeah. They, they they do two of them together. Maybe, maybe it requires um, already, like, it takes some time to do, mm-hmm. which explains why maybe it has a paralysis beam. Yeah. So, it, it traps you, and then it, like, like sits you under this lamp it like stares at you with these two beams for a while until you it changes something about your internal processes or something okay yeah and then your body starts to convert all of the energy within it into bioluminescent okay yeah i like that yeah yeah so like your blood starts to glow and then your fat stores start to glow and then your skin and then your bones and like oh that's so gross i love it and that explains why they they would be sort of kind of conquering and predatory Mm -hmm. like why they would need to go for so much like biomass is that like they're harvesting it to turn it into light for itself for themselves and of course they did they take out the good bits the eyeballs and whatnot yeah yeah yeah. they they go through and they harvest all the useful stuff first so so they just have these you know sightless moaning yeah but for for important horror reasons the creature still has to be alive in order to produce the bile yeah still gotta exactly um, so when you, it's really obvious when you get to a beholder layer because there will be like creatures like accreted to the walls, like held down with formed stone who are- Alien style. Alien style who are bioluminescing and like suffering very obviously. Um, okay. Hmm. Would it be thematically inappropriate for them to be deaf? Um, thematically appropriate because they're all about sight and eyes and they don't physically I, have ears. I like it. Yeah. And so they're also deaf to the screams of all the creatures in their tunnels. Mm-hmm. And they maybe use something else to communicate, like like light. Like maybe they mm-hmm. use, maybe they can produce light from at least some of their eye stalks and they use that to speak to one another. And so, so they speak in Morse. Something along those lines, yeah. Or binary or any number of like flashing or like they could use color as well. If you're mm-hmm. using both like beep, 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 and also like red, green, blue, mm-hmm. red, green, yellow, you know, like you could get a lot of data into a uh, a beholder's. One, one of the rays is also um, a telekinesis ray. Right, so they can move things around. Yeah, so that could also be like, uh, they could communicate through like tactile sensation or something. Yeah, totally. Oh, okay. So they're, they're really gross flesh to stone spell. Mm-hmm. I'm going to make a, a, a little twist on it, which is that if they turn something from flesh to stone while it's in contact with stone, the two of them merge together as well. Okay. And it doesn't have to do all at once. Okay. So it can like, like they could hold, like use a telekinesis to like hold your hand against the stone and turn your hand to stone, which is now stuck to the rock, but you're still stuck to your hand as a way to like, this is how they get things up on the wall to create their, their bioluminescent lamps and stuff. Mm-hmm. Sticky tack it to the wall. Yeah. But basically they like lick it and then just, <laughs> So gross. And that makes a lot. Okay. So yeah. And if they, if they can't hear, then that means that they don't, they don't speak. And that means that we don't have to worry about them not having lungs or anything like that for their, with their big old mouth thing. It just like, just kind of flaps around in there and they don't scream or anything like that. They don't make, they don't, they're not going to talk to you. But so, so, a particularly advanced one might still have telepathic abilities to like speak into your mind or something mm. like that. So if if they don't really have any need to chew anything, they mm. probably don't have teeth either. I think people call them teeth, but they're not actually teeth because I think they're on the outside of its mouth. Does that okay. make sense? Like it's like it's got the the opening of its mouth, mm-hmm. and then the teeth. Like normally teeth, they would be behind the lips, mm-hmm. and these are more like horns sticking out just outside of the lips. Okay, because a primitive beholder who hadn't developed the um, the telekinesis ray yet mm-hmm. used that for manipulation and as a weapon. So like used to be like primitive beholders before they became intelligent would bite each other, like just literally like tear each other apart with these like teeth, quote unquote, which are mm-hmm. more like antlers or horns. Unless you have something worse than that to come <laughs> like because I'm I'm just thinking like I still want them to have teeth because that would be like a big toothy maw, but like they're on the outside. So like, okay, ah. yeah, yeah, I like that. I was also thinking they have like cilia or something on the inside of their mouth to like kind of guide. Oh no, that's great too. They, they we have both. Yeah, <laughs> porque no las dos. You know, guide guide in the new eyeballs and oh whatnot. yeah, um, yeah. Because I was about to think like, why do they have tongues? And no, no, they have thousands of tiny little tongues. Ah, <laughs> uh, I don't know we would, that we would still recognize this as a beholder, but I love how awful looking it is. No, I think it's I think from a silhouette and like it's okay, yeah. it's basic idea is all still totally beholder. Mm-hmm. It's just a little bit less D and D beholder and a little bit more uh, xenomorph. 
<laughs> okay, yeah, no, I like that. Uh, yeah, totally. Yeah, this is cool. I also like the idea of light, a horror element. Mm -hmm. in, yeah, totally. In this, where so commonly it's, uh, you know, the darkness and whatnot mm -hmm. that, that you fear. But when you start seeing, you know, these these glowing human effigies. Yeah. And even, like, just looking down a tunnel and seeing that light, mm -hmm. like, under normal circumstances, that should be so enlightening, like the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. But if the light at the end of the tunnel is a beholder layer, you know, or even just the flashes of beholders talking to each other, like mm -hmm. the shifting Aurora style lights okay, or yeah. that rapid pulsing, you know, mm -hmm. as they, as they move around and they talk, uh, that would be super creepy. And they never make any noise because they don't walk. So they're not going to hear their footsteps and they don't speak to one another. So it's just a silent approach. Or maybe they're just like, well, are, are they um, emitting any of that 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 phlogiston that they consume, like as propulsion? I think, I think they can, but they don't normally do. That would be my way to go because they they only have a limited amount of it inside them. They have to mm -hmm. make more if they want more. And with like things like the telekinesis yeah. and whatnot, you could so, easily. There's not there's no reason that says they have to have all the same number of various tentacles. So mm -hmm. I think they've got at least a couple of tentacles which are like telekinesis ones. Okay. And maybe those have a longer life or like they have a certain number of hours before they have to go out. Like they can mm -hmm. just use them. And that means for moving around in tunnels, they can just like bounce the telekinesis off of the wall basically mm -hmm. as like a form of force. Yeah. But that if they ever need to go really fast, really quickly, they open their mouth and they just expunge the phlogiston, which is a jet, that's a rocket propulsion. And they go flying backwards, Nautilus shell style. I love it. Which is very clumsy and leaves them vulnerable afterwards because they will have less phlogiston to keep themselves afloat. Mm -hmm. But it will get them out of a situation very quickly. So what happens when it does fully use up all its phlogiston? If it can't use the phlogiston, I think it, A, it has to deflate at mm -hmm. least a bit. Like it can't be fully like round anymore. Uh -huh. And you start to see much more of the things inside of it the various sacks in the back of its own eyeball and like all mm -hmm. these various structures inside of it like that's all deflated and visible and i think if they have a lot of power left in them like they've 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 been well fed they have all their eyeballs out they can use a couple of their telepathic eyeballs to keep themselves up off the ground and do some moving around but it's now it's not effortless now it's not easy now it's kind of like walking on stilts with telekinesis exactly it's like and then if it if it runs out of those too, it's just a sack on the ground and it's completely helpless. Okay, I love that. Which yeah. is, gr yeah, that's no good. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> I wish this was the beholder. Like this is so, to me, this is so much better than the regular beholder, which is, is kind of goofy, <laughs> a little bit weird. Some of the art has made them look a lot better, but this one is such a disaster. <laughs> I love it. It is so awful. Uh, that's what we do. That's what we do here on Monster Mechanics. Well, on that note, I think we're, unless you have more ideas... No, I think we're good. Yeah, we are more. Yeah, we're not. Well, we maybe not good, but we're done. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Monster Mechanics. You can find links and show notes at our website, monsterpod.org. Or if you'd like to support us, head on over to patreon.com slash monsterpod. We can be found on Twitter at monstermpod, or you can email us at monstermechanicspodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your feedback. Monster Mechanics is produced and edited by Scott Paladin. This episode was hosted by Scott Paladin and Zach Jakeways. All of the ideas produced during this podcast are released under a do-what-the-f*** you want public license.